Welcome to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. This teaching is from the series Game of Thrones, The Reign of David. This series looks at the reign of David in the books of 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles to learn from David's victories and failures to see how we can walk more closely with Jesus. Today I'm going to be teaching out of 2 Samuel 13 and 14. But rather than reading the two chapters, which would take probably like 10 minutes, I'm actually just going to read a selection of verses from uh, 2 Samuel 13 and, and the first verse in chapter 14, verse 1. They're in the little uh, booklet you have. I remind you that the booklet each week has got not only our scripture text, but it's got uh, some uh, devotional guide and discussion guide that some of our small groups are also doing to help you kind of meditate on the text, think through it, work through it, and uh, apply the text. So we're going to be continuing on in Game of Thrones. I do want to thank Tony for teaching last week. He did a great job on Psalm 110. If you uh, didn't get to hear it, I encourage you to go back. You can either watch it on Facebook Live or you can uh, download uh, the teaching and the notes off of our website. So we're going to look this morning at 2 Samuel 13. We're going to read verses 20 to 22 and then 37 to 39 out of chapter 13 and then chapter 14, verse 1 to kind of frame what we're going to talk about this morning. So hear now the words of our sovereign, holy, just, loving, and merciful God. Her brother Absalom said to her, Has that Amnon, your brother, been with you? Be quiet now, my sister. He's your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. And Tamar lived in her brother Absalom's house, a desolate woman. When King David heard all this, he was furious. Absalom never said a word to Amnon, either good or bad. He hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister Tamar. And then down in verse 37, this is after Absalom has killed Amnon. Absalom fled and went to tell my son of Amihud, the king of Geshur. But King David mourned for his son every day. And after Absalom fled and went to Geshur, he stayed there three years. And the spirit of the king longed to go to Absalom, for he was consoled concerning Amnon's death. And Joab, son of Zeruiah, knew that the king's heart longed for Absalom. March the 7th, 1936, the army of Germany, the Nazi army, sent troops into the Rhineland. It was an important event because the Rhineland had been demilitarized uh, as part of the Versailles Treaty. There were not supposed to be troops there. And when the Germans marched in, it was a huge moment because everybody had seen the growing problem going on under the leadership of Adolf Hitler. And so the question was, what are they going to do? And the answer is, they did absolutely nothing. They couldn't decide uh, whether they wanted to try and stand up to the Germans and take a risk of war, and everyone was still suffering after World War I. Nobody had the stomach for any more bloodshed. But should they go in and take the risk of war, or should they sit back and say, in honor of trying to keep peace, we'll do nothing? And they could not make a decision. They were indecisive, and as a result, nothing happened. They didn't even recognize that it was okay for Germany to do that. And that set off a domino effect, as it was not only done there, they later on had, uh, went, went in and they, they brought in Austria-Hungary, they brought in the Sudetenland and Czechoslovakia, and nothing happened all the way until finally they invaded into Poland and World War II began. I bring this up because that pattern that was there of the leaders looking and wanting two things, and they could not figure out how to reconcile those two things. They wanted to stop the growth of the Nazi power, but on the other hand, they were trying to avoid conflict at any cost, it seemed like. It led them to a place of indecision, and as a result, the problem only grew. Now, this is very parallel to what we see going on in King David's life at this point. David, who we've tracked as a congregation all the way through 1 Samuel from chapter 16 forward, in the earlier parts of the story is a very decisive man. 
But by the time we arrive here and there is the sin going on in David's house, David is incredibly indecisive. And growing problems that are enveloping his house and ultimately the nation, David can't seem to decide what to do and how to act against it. So we want to look at today kind of the outflow of what happened in the incident between Amnon and Tamar that we looked at a couple of weeks ago. Uh, We want to ask ourselves, why is David not reacting, and what does it teach us in our own lives? So let's begin by looking at the trouble in the house of David. And I remind us, we looked at the very disturbing story a couple of weeks ago where Amnon raped his sister Tamar. And uh, we called it Tamar too. We looked at the incident of sexual abuse. And in verse 20, our text today, it reminds us of what's going on, that this is first off something that's going on in David's own family. Notice in verse 20, it says her brother Absalom. It's noting the, the relationship between Tamar and Absalom. And he says, has not that Amnon your brother been with you? Be quiet now, my sister. He's your brother. Don't take it to heart. And Tamar lived in her brother Absalom's house. Notice five times in that one verse it mentions brother and sister. And actually 20 times in 2 Samuel 13, brother or sister are used to note that this is something growing up within the house of David. And if you remember back to David's sin with Bathsheba, the very house that God had made covenant with David and promised that Messiah was going to come from, which Tony taught us last week on Psalm 110, how, how the Messiah was going to come out of David's house and be the Lord and ruler over all things. That very house David brought sin into in the incident with Bathsheba, and God said, This is going to continue on in your house now. The house that's going to bring salvation is also going to have all kinds of problems within it, David. And so how's David going to respond to the trouble when one son rapes one of his daughters and then the other brother is now taking care of that sister? How is David going to respond to the trouble? The answer is David is completely indecisive and doesn't know what to do. Notice in verses 21 and 22, we read, When King David heard all of this, he was furious. Now David is rightly furious with Amnon. How could someone not be furious with one of your children who has behaved in this way? But notice what the text doesn't say. It doesn't say he was furious and he did whatever. It just says he was furious. And apparently David sat around and did nothing to deal with his son's behavior. There is no record in the text that he did it. Now, why would David do this? I believe there are several seeds that are behind David's indecision. Number one, David knew that that Amnon had done evil. There was no question what Amnon had done was evil. But the first problem David's got is, if he wants to confront Amnon for his sexual sin, what can Amnon say back to David? Yeah, who are you to speak to me? You did the same thing. Where do you think I learned this kind of behavior? You saw someone you wanted. You reached out and you took her. You violated what God said. So who are you to speak to me? This is one of the problems we have with sin. Unless one is a huge hypocrite, how do you speak to someone regarding their sin when you have the same sin in your own life? So that's the first problem David's got. Secondly, David appears throughout these chapters to be very worried about his own dynasty. He's worried, how is the son of David going to sit on the throne? God has told me it's going to happen, but I'm worried about how that's going to happen. And Amnon is his heir. Amnon is his oldest son. He's the one who should inherit the throne. And so David looks and says, what Amnon did was wrong, but if I confront that, what does that mean for my dynasty? Thirdly, David is having a wrestling here. His love for his son is eclipsing his willingness to deal justly with his son's behavior. He's got this struggle with love and justice going on. I mentioned a a couple of weeks ago when I taught on this that actually the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and at least one Dead Sea Scroll have a phrase that's not uh, in our accepted text, and that phrase is, that David was exceedingly, he was furious, but he would not hurt Amnon because he was his eldest son, 
and he loved him. And though that's not in most of our text, that idea is clearly there. David's struggling. He knows what Amnon did is wrong, but he loves Amnon. And so how does he uh, get between, how does he reconcile the call of justice and this call of love? And this distorted parental love ends up being the undoing of Amnon. Make no mistake, as we're reading it and we know the story, Amnon is going to end up dying over this. And Scripture is replete with the example of parents who, because of a distorted parental love, will not confront sin in their children, and not doing so hardens the children in sin, and it ends up leading to their own destruction. In fact, if you remember, the reason kings came to Israel was because Eli did exactly that with his own sons. And then Samuel, who was raised up to speak God's word against, uh, of judgment against Eli, did the same thing with his own sons. And now David is repeating the pattern himself. And so David is rightly furious with Amnon, and he wants to act, but he can't reconcile justice and love. I know he should be dealt with, but I love him. And how do I do that? And David can't decide, so he does nothing. And he does nothing for two years. And so the question then is, there's another main actor here. Remember, Absalom is actually the main actor in these chapters. Whereas David is indecisive, Amnon is any, I mean, Absalom is anything but indecisive. And the chapter actually begins, the first person mentioned in 2 Samuel 13 is actually Absalom. Because Absalom dominates. He's mentioned a hundred times in these chapters. He's the man of action in the chapters while David is wavering and can't decide what to do. And so notice there in the verse that while David is furious in doing nothing, Absalom's not speaking to Amnon, but what he is doing is he is seething inside. He is furious. And he's not only furious, if you really follow the text, with Amnon, he's also growing increasingly frustrated and furious with his father because David is doing nothing about it. And Absalom sits, and he's, he's growing in anger. He's growing in rage towards his father. He is becoming increasingly dissatisfied and disrespectful towards David, which is going to usher in his later rebellion. Make no mistake, when we get to chapter 15, Absalom is full bore on trying to stoke rebellion against his father. And the seeds of that are all the way back here. Because see, what Absalom is doing is he's rightly upset that David has done nothing. But what should he do? He should go to David and confront David about that. But there's no note that he does that. What he does is, and this is, I'm, you've probably never done this in your own life. But rather than dealing with it, he sits back in quiet and he has little conversations inside his head. And he's nursing his anger. He's nursing his sense of injustice at what David has done. And he's getting more and more angry. And notice he does not say a word to Amnon. There's nothing in the text that says he says a word to David. It's just all inside him. And it's building. And make no mistake, that's going to be the undoing of Absalom as well. And so, just a little tidbit, if you have a problem with someone's behavior, the thing to do is to go to the person, not to sit back on your own. In the dark, in quiet, sin grows. That's what it does. So, Absalom watches this, and he decides that he's going to murder Amnon. And the text tells us he waits two years plotting his revenge. Two years he does this. And he decides what he's going to do is he's going to throw a party at sheep shearing time. It's a big festive time. And so he says, I'm going to have a big party. And he goes to David and says, Father, I would like you and all of your sons to come to this big party I'm going to throw. 
And David says, no, son, that would be too much. We'd just be a burden to you. Don't do all that. And then Absalom says, okay, then uh, how about if Amnon comes? Now, if David is acting with any sense, what should he say? Mm, what's going on here, Absalom? And he asks some questions, but Absalom convinces him, and David sends Amnon down to this party at sheep shearing time. And at the party, Absalom uh, tells his men to rise up and strike Amnon down and kill him. And you have to understand part of what's going on here that the writer is doing is if you remember when Tamar was there and Amnon was, was threatening to grab her and force himself upon her, she said, don't do this wicked, foolish thing. And I told you all, the, the Hebrew word is Nabal, from which Nabal in 1 Samuel 25 got his name. And if you remember, at sheep shearing time, Nabal was struck dead and died. And now Amnon, whom Tamar had said, if you do this, you're going to be known as a wicked fool in Israel, at sheep shearing time is struck dead and dies. His wickedness has come home on his own head. But David hears the report, and immediately, somehow the word filters back that all of his sons are dead. And so David tears his clothes and puts dust on his head, and he goes into weeping and mourning, and he thinks that they're all dead. But then another man there, uh, Jonadab, corrects him. And it's kind of interesting because Jonadab was at the beginning of the story. He's the guy that recommended to Amnon what to do. And Jonadab seems to know what's going on. And he tells David in verse 32, My Lord should not think that they killed all the princes. Only Amnon is dead. And notice these words. This has been Absalom's expressed intention since the day Amnon raped his sister Tamar. Now get the picture again. Jonadab knows what Absalom's been nursing in his heart and going on, but does David? David's clueless. And you have to see throughout these chapters, David's presented in a way he doesn't recognize what's going on. Sin has blinded David. The man who always seemed to perceive what was happening, knew the dangers that were around him, was always seeking Yahweh. Suddenly, he can't recognize the dangers that are besetting him all about. And so Jonadab says, look, Absalom's been planning this for two years. The, the Hebrews literally has been in his mouth for two years. He's been, he's been upset about this. He's been ruminating. He's been muttering about this to himself. The king apparently didn't notice this, but the only one that's dead is Amnon. And so then Absalom has to flee, and he actually flees to his maternal grandfather because he says, if I stay in Israel, I'm going to be put to death for killing Amnon. But then what happens is we get David's indecisiveness part two. It's kind of like when the leaders didn't confront Hitler for sending the troops into the Rhineland, and then they're given another opportunity later when he's doing more, and they don't do it again. In fact, they come back with the Munich Pact and say, this is peace in our time, when all they're really doing is being indecisive. Well, David is acting the same way. So notice in verses 38, chapter 13, verse 38 to 14, 1, we read, Absalom flees and he goes to uh, Geshur, which is where his maternal grandfather is the king. But we're told in verse 39, and the spirit of the king longed to go to Absalom. And in chapter 14, verse 1, Joab knows that the king's heart longed for Absalom. And this lasts for three years. It's now been five years since Amnon had raped his sister Tamar, David's daughter. Uh, Absalom has waited for two years, and he's three years in exile. And David's longing to go to Absalom, but he's indecisive again. He can't decide what to do. He knows what Absalom did was wrong, but he loves Absalom. So how is he going to act? And the answer is he does the same thing he did with Amnon, which is nothing. The picture is he sits there on his throne day after day, stuck in indecision while Joab acts and watches. And note, Joab is decisive and acts. Absalom is decisive and acts. Virtually everyone around is decisive and acting except for David. He cannot decide what to do. So he does nothing one way or the other. Now, 
Just as I told you the seeds regarding David's indecisiveness with Amnon, it's the exact same seeds here. David knows what Absalom has done was evil. He had taken vigilante justice. Of course, the problem is David had committed exactly the same sin. So if he confronts Absalom, Absalom can say, hey, at least I took justice against my brother who had raped someone. You put Uriah to death, and he had done nothing wrong. I killed a man who had committed sexual sin. You killed a man to cover your sexual sin. So David says, how do I, I, there's no way forward for me to act. Once again, our sin oftentimes makes it impossible for us to make a decision. We're like, I'm trapped, what can I do? David also is now worried because now that Amnon is dead, guess who's the heir? Absalom. So now I've lost the guy who was here. How's my dynasty going to go on? If I deal with Absalom, now I've lost yet another heir. How is God's word to me going to be fulfilled if I do this? And thirdly, we're told directly in the text that David longed for Absalom. He loves Absalom. And we're going to see this even after Absalom commits rebellion. You remember the time's going to come where when Absalom dies, David's more upset about Absalom dying than he is excited about the fact that the kingdom has been saved. David's love for Absalom is eclipsing his willingness to deal with Absalom's evil behavior. Once again, same picture, distorted parental love is making it uh, him unable to deal with his son's sin. And once again, the long-term fruit of that is going to be the destruction of that child. Because David does not deal with Absalom early on, it's now grown to the point that there's virtually no turning back. And so there is a warning to us as parents, and I want to encourage you regarding this. It is so easy. I remember with four kids, it's so easy sometimes just to turn and act like I didn't see something. It's also a foolish choice. Because consider what happened. Who knows how different this story would have been if David had dealt with Amnon. But he didn't. And if he had talked to Absalom, but he didn't. And if when Absalom did something, he dealt with him, but he didn't. And in all of that, sin kept growing. So what we're given a picture here in these chapters is the indecisive king. He, he just can't act. David sits there. Now, notice, again, in verses 1 and 2, he's longing for Absalom. And Joab finally, after three years, says, this guy's not going to do anything, so I'm going to do something. So Joab goes a few miles away to a town named Tekoa, and he finds a wise woman there. We're not giving her name. She's just referred to as the wise woman of Tekoa. And he brings her back to David, and he says, I want you to go, and, and we're going to do this before. When David was stuck before, after the Uriah Bathsheba incident, Nathan had to come, and Nathan told David a story asking David for a decision as like the supreme judge in the land, and that's what got David to recognize it. So let's do the same thing. So this woman comes, and she tells a parable just like Nathan had done, and the results are the same. In this case, she tells a story. She says, look, I had one son. They got in a fight with his brother, and one brother killed another brother. And now everybody is saying justice demands that we put that brother to death and then I'm left with no son whatsoever. And so I'm appealing to you, will you give protection to that child? Will you restore that child's life to me? And David says, go in peace. It'll all be taken care of. I'll make sure. But she keeps asking and she keeps asking. And finally, David gives the same oath he had given to Nathan. He says, as surely as the Lord lives, same oath he had given to Nathan. This is what ought to happen in this situation. And then the woman comes back and says, she doesn't bring Nathan into it, but this is the same thing you've done before, David. Your decision indicts yourself. Notice what she says in verses 13 and 14. She says, when the king says this, does he not convict himself? For the king has not brought back his banished son. 
David, would I tell you a story and you're an objective observer? You can figure out how to work this and you know what the resolution ought to be. But in the exact same situation in your own life, you've been sitting around now for five years doing nothing. Nothing. Once again, very brave woman. I have to give it to this woman. She's very brave. She's very careful how she says it to David, but she points it out. I also want you to know that she pronounces the gospel, and we're going to come back to this, because this is all a mess, but it's why we need the gospel. Notice what she says in verse 14. She says, God doesn't take away life. Instead, he devises ways so that the banished person may not remain estranged from him. Friends, that is the gospel. You and I are banished rightly. You and I are estranged from God rightly. But thanks be to God, he doesn't sit on his throne like David doing nothing. He devises a way, the gospel, so that love and justice can meet and be reconciled. And this woman says, that's what God would do, David, and you're supposed to represent God, but you're sitting here and you're doing nothing. Now what's interesting, and I will point this out, she then goes on and she speaks in this little parable and in her discussion with David, she speaks of David's knowledge and wisdom, which are clearly not true. Okay, notice in verses 17 and 20, she says, my Lord the King is like an angel of God in discerning good and evil. Has David been wise in figuring out good and evil? Not at all. He hasn't known what's going on. And then she says in verse 20, My Lord has wisdom like that of an angel of God. He knows everything that happens in the land. He didn't know what Amnon was planning. He didn't know what Absalom was planning. And we're going to see once Absalom's restored, Absalom's going to get the entire country to rise up in rebellion against David. And the only person that seems to not recognize what's going on is David. So, Contrary to this, he's actually blind right now. That's what's going on, which is why he can't make a decision. He's become frozen in indecision. And that continues on. I bring that up because David listens to her, and he says he's going to restore Absalom, but even then he can only do it in a half-measured way. Notice in verses 21 and 24, he calls Joab in because he does figure out Okay, Joab's behind all this. He calls Joab in and he says this, Very well, I will do it. Go bring back the young man, Absalom. And Joab bows down and he says, Oh, thank you, king. I know I found favor that you'll do this. But in verse 24 he says, But the king said, He must go to his own house. He must not see my face. So Absalom went to his own house And did not see the face of the king. Now you need to understand Absalom's house is probably like right down the hill from David's. They like share a driveway. Okay? But David says, I am not to see him. He's coming back. He's being restored. But I'm keeping him at arm's length. This is only a halfway restoration. Because he's frozen in indecision, he won't truly restore Absalom because he will not even see him. And so what this does is it leads to increasing levels of frustration for Absalom. It does not resolve the situation. It actually only makes the situation worse. And so Absalom sits for another two years. It's now been seven years and Absalom sits in his house and he stews and he watches David come and he watches David go and he says and David says he brought me back but I can't see the king he's not dealing with anything and this is more frustrating than it was at least when I was banished in another land I could kind of come and go and do what I want here I can't see my own father and so Absalom tries to get Joab to talk to him and Joab won't So finally, Absalom tells some guys that work for him, okay, go down to Joab's field, set it on fire. That'll get him to come talk to me. And sure enough, it does. Joab gets upset and says, what in the world were you doing? And Absalom says, well, you wouldn't come talk to me. So once again, David may not be taking action. I'm taking action. I wanted you here. I got you here. And so he tells Joab, he says, I want you to deal with this situation. And Absalom's words reveal his frustration, but also his refusal to acknowledge his sin. We see that in seven years, 
Absalom's never recognized anything going on. In five years since he killed his brother, there's no recognition of his sin. Notice in verse 32, Absalom said to Joab, Look, I sent word to you and said, Come here so I can send you to the king and ask, Why have I come from Geshur? It would be better for me if I were still there. I would rather be banished rather than this half measure. Now then, I want to see the king's face. And if I am guilty of anything, let him put me to death. Who could answer that question for Absalom? It, you, you took vigilante justice. You're definitely guilty. It's not even a question. This one isn't hard. You are guilty. But see, in Absalom's own eyes, he doesn't feel that way because he's been sitting around and he's been nursing and he's been thinking through it. Have you ever done that? You get alone, you think through something, you tell it, you retell it, you retell it, and pretty soon you're a knight in shining armor or a fair damsel, and I did nothing wrong. And then people are like, what? That's not the way this happened. And that's exactly what's going on with Absalom. He says, I didn't do anything wrong, but in fact, he has done wrong. Now, the important point for us to see here is half restoration, which is what David's done, does not satisfy justice or mercy. It does neither. David was sitting around in indecision, and what he did was he brought him halfway back, but there's still no justice towards Absalom. And there's also no real restoration. There's really no love here. And so he is uh, trapped in this. Now, finally, what happens is because Joab goes back to David, David says, fine, let Absalom come. And he does let Absalom come in, and Absalom bows before him, and we finally start to get restoration. But make no mistake about it, seven years in, the damage is done. The damage is done. And so what we're going to be seeing next week is a whole series of rebellions that are going to kick off in David's kingdom because David was so indecisive and wouldn't do it. So in these chapters, he is stuck in indecision. He's angry with Abs Amnon, does nothing for two years. He's angry with banished, exiled Absalom, but he does nothing for three years. He partially restores Absalom, but then still won't see him, which is the worst case. It is not forgiveness to relationally penalize someone, which is exactly what he's doing. There's no real restoration for what Absalom wanted. And David is almost blind in these chapters. That's part of his indecision. He can't see what Amnon's doing. He can't see what Absalom's uh, planning is doing. He can't see that the parable directly applies to him. I mean, as you're listening to the lady, you're like, well, David's going to understand this is about him. He does not get it or see it. And he won't see Absalom's growing rebellion coming. And then the final thing that is a huge note regarding his indecision if you read chapter 14, you'll notice there is a word that does not appear anywhere in the chapter. And the word is David. He's never referred to, in the, he's always the king. The king did this, the king did that, because David is just a shell of his former self. David, the man of action, the man that comes up when the whole army is quaking and Goliath stands there and he says, who is this guy to rebuke the army of God? I'll go out, I'll strike him down, I'll deal with him. David, the man who strikes down the Philistines. David, the man who always knows what to do, now sits on his throne and has no clue what to do because his sin has trapped him and he cannot resolve the, the riddle, as it were, between justice and love. And he's sowing seeds of major problems in the future for him and his kingdom. Now, how do we apply this? What does this mean for us? And we'll come to the Lord's table. There's a lot of things we could talk about out of these chapters. I just want to talk about two this morning. First is a question for us. Do I see that indecisive half measures hurt relationships. They don't solve the problem. In fact, it's kind of like when Jesus told the church, I'd rather you be hot or cold. Don't be lukewarm. 
lukewarm restoration, halfway restoration, is worse than just complete separation. It's the worst of all possible situation. David's indecisive measures in the chapters are creating and furthering relational problems in his family. Remember I showed you, you know, five times in the one verse, it was all these family words, 20 times in chapter 13. David's not acting, and it's creating further problems in his own family. Now the problem is when we're not sure how to respond, what we're tempted to do is to keep people at arm's length. Somehow to kind of say, well, I kind of forgive you, but I don't want to actually deal with you. I don't want to have face-to-face relationship. So I'll say I forgive, but I'll keep the relationship off at arm's length. But what that does is it just creates frustration, which is a rich, fertilized soil for sin to grow. And this is essential for us to understand in our relationship. The worst possible response is proclaiming to someone, I forgive you, but then not restoring the relationship. Now understand, there can be consequences, but to say you're forgiven and then say, but I'm not restoring relationship is the worst possible response. Such measures are not reflective of the gospel, and therefore they destroy the relationship. When God brings us in, friends, you are never left sitting in a house down the hill. That's not what the gospel does for you and me. The gospel restores us. So the question that comes to me out of this is, is there anyone I have done this to in a relationship? Let me give a couple of possible things. Spouse, where I've half forgiven for past sins rather than working through issues so the two can become one. I've never seen this in actuality before, but I've read about it in a book. It is so easy for spouses. Very often, when you talk to people whose marriages are really in crisis, the actual issues are things that happened years and years and years ago. And what happened was there was kind of, I forgive you, but we never actually restored the relationship. And that's just, it's just fertilizer to the soil for sin to grow. And God's call is that the two would become one. And if we cannot deal with that past sin, if we cannot deal with the past hurt, but we say, okay, bring them back, but basically you're not going to see my face. Basically, I'm not going to open up to you. We're not going to do this anymore. What we're doing is we're encouraging sin to grow. We're encouraging the destruction of the relationship. Now, it's hard when you're David to figure out what to do with Absalom. But what not to do is bring him back and have him stay down the hill. That's definitely what not to do. But very often, We are tempted to do that, and I bring up spouse first because that's the person where there's going to be the most. The person I have wronged the most in my life is my wife because I've got far, 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 far more opportunity to sin against her than I do anyone else. So the, the paradox is the last person on earth I want to sin against is my wife. But there's so much context for it. If I can't learn to walk in real forgiveness, if she can't learn to walk in real forgiveness, there's no way for the two to be one. So have I done that with my spouse? Because if you're sitting here and you've done that, we need to work through that. We need to clean that out. We need to get out and say, I'm not doing these half measures. When I say forgiven, we're going to work through this and we are going to be face to face. You're not only going to be restored, you're going to see my face. I'm going to open myself up. Let me give another one. Children. If you're a parent and your children have not disappointed you, I assume they're like 37 seconds old. They will, and it will continue, and you are going to face things. I have had a situation where I have had a grown child 
wanting my approval of something that they knew when they came to me they weren't going to get my approval of it. And I had to say, you didn't seriously think I was going to approve of this behavior. You know I'm not going to approve this behavior. But here's where the challenge comes in. What I did not do is say, therefore, live down the hill, you will not see my face again. No. I don't approve of this. I can't bless this. But I am not going to relationally distance myself from you. Not going to do that. I love you. You're my child. I have spoken justice to you, and now I'm going to speak love to you. And I will not keep you at arm's distance. I have watched so much through the years. This is when legalism invades in the church. This is our go-to response. When a child does something you don't like, you relationally shun them. You penalize them because somehow that will speak the gospel to them, right? It's so painful. And I did spend time in my Christian life doing that when I was under legalism, thinking that if I relationally penalize my children, that'll really show them. And what it really does is it causes sin to grow up. And it's my fault. Am I doing that with my kids? Are there friends where we relationally withdraw rather than working through issues to restore friendship. Again, if you're going to be friends with people over time, we are going to disappoint one another. We are going to sin against one another, or sometimes I'm going to misunderstand what you've done as sin. Am I willing to work through that? Because you know what the great American trademark move is? Just pick up and go somewhere else. We've been doing this forever as a culture. If you're not getting along with the people in Massachusetts, just move west. And then when you're not getting along with them, just move a little further west until we get all the way to the Pacific and then there's nowhere to move. And that's what we've done. It's built into our national character. And so if I struggle with people in the church, I just pick up and find another church. If I struggle with friends, I just leave them and find other friends. It's what we do as a culture. But all that does is just put calluses around our hearts. And it's just a rich soil for sin to grow up. We have to work through the issues and relationally restore to one another. So let the Lord speak to you if there's any areas where that's true in your own life. Now the second thing we want to do is we want to talk about the gospel of justice and love. I want to look back at verse 14 of 2 Samuel 14 again and remind you what the wise woman of Tekoa said, and she was very wise in this. God does not take away life. Instead, he devises ways so that a banished person may not remain estranged from him. And friends, here's the good news. God has devised that way. The gospel is the way that God has done to bring us back from banishment. You and I struggle to reconcile justice and mercy, holiness and love. But God has done this perfectly in the gospel. Don't hear me wrongly this morning. I, in a sense, empathize with David. How do you make these decisions if you're him? It's very hard to do. We struggle with this, particularly because of our own sin. But thanks be to God, he doesn't struggle. He is not trying to figure out how to do it. He has once and for all done this. Christ's redeeming work is the decisive action of both justice and mercy, holiness and love. It's not like at the cross, Jesus said, well, we kind of did the holiness thing for a while. That was called the Old Testament. Now we're going to do the love thing. That's not what's going on at the cross. At the cross, perfect holiness perfect love and mercy god's unchanging character of integrity are all met at the cross of jesus christ sin is atoned for justice is done because of the love of god god does this for us in the gospel in christ's redeeming work the justice of god against sin is fully met and the mercy of god towards sinners is fully fully experienced. And so 
what this means for us is because Christ has fully expressed the justice and love of God, we are not partially restored to our Father, but are received as wholly accepted children. Please hear me. Here is what everyone in this room is tempted to believe when we sin. That God the Father says, bring them back and you live down the hill. And don't come in and look at my face. And you believe that in your heart of hearts, and so do I. And the gospel says that is not true. Justice has been paid by Jesus Christ. And when God brings us back, he is not a father who says, go down the hill and don't see my face. He is the father in the story of the prodigal son who runs and meets us and says, bring out the robe. Put the ring on his hand. Kill the fatted calf. My child is home. That's the gospel. Friends, I hope you understand out of this. Please, please, please hear me. Do not let Satan convince you that God has only halfway accepted you. Our father, our king, is the decisive king. He has acted, and He has done it to restore us and to bring us to Himself fully in Christ Jesus. If you have any sense that I'm banished, I'm left out, do not listen to that voice. God has brought you back. That's what He has done for us in Jesus Christ. Now what we're going to do is we're going to come to this table And this table is the perfect picture of the justice and the love of God. In this table, we are reminded that Christ has fully borne the just wrath of God so that we might receive the merciful love of God. And so this morning, if you're here and you've struggled with what I was just talking about, And you think, there's this past thing. And the past thing may be from this morning, something you did on the way here to the meeting, or it might be something that happened 30 years ago. And you've been bearing that weight. I want you to hear the voice of God this morning. God's heart is to devise a way to bring the banished sinner home. And that's what he's done for us in Christ. And so as you come to the table this morning, if you got sin, confess it. Open up. Don't don't be Absalom and say, well, I didn't do anything wrong. Open up and confess it. But know that you have a father who is glad to let his face be turned toward you, to let his face shine upon you despite your sin because Christ has worked justice and love. If you're a guest with us, you don't have to be a member of our church to take communion. You need to believe the gospel, which is what I've just been talking about, that you are a sinner. You do deserve to be banished from the presence of God, but Jesus has opened the way for us to come back. If you believe that, please participate with us. In a moment when we hand out the elements as well, if you uh, prefer gluten-free, if you raise your hand, we will bring you gluten-free bread Uh, for the elements. Friends, let's come to the table of justice and love. For what I receive from the Lord, I pass on to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink from this, all of you, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we thank you that you have provided and made redemption for us. Lord, I pray this morning for anyone here, Lord, if I have a brother or sister here 
who feels like you've restored halfway, send your Holy Spirit forth. Open their eyes that they know in Christ your face shines upon them. I ask you to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to distribute the elements. As you get them, please hold on to them, and then we will take them together in just a couple moments. Holy Father, justice demands that sin be judged and paid for in full. This is a fearful thought for we who are covered in sin. For you are infinitely great, and so the demands of justice must be infinitely great as well. How could we, finite and fallen as we are, ever pay such a price? So you intervene, sending your own Son to bear our sin and to receive the just penalty we were due. Because he is truly and fully human, he was able to fulfill our obligations to you by completely obeying your law and suffering and dying for our disobedience. And because he is truly and fully God, his obedience and suffering were of infinite value. And he was able to bear your full justice against wrath and sin and overcome Satan and death. So we give you thanks that through his broken body, justice has been met and we have been fully restored to fellowship with you. Take and Father, you are the God of love. Because of this, when we were rebels to your will, you sent your Son to save, deliver, and restore us to yourself. Lord Jesus Christ, you have so loved us that you laid down your very life, pouring out your blood so that our sins could be forgiven and removed. We give you thanks for your precious blood and your love that is stronger than death. We rejoice in the removal of our sins and the restoration of our relationship with God our Father. Take and Father, we thank you that you devised the way to restore us so that we are no longer estranged from you. In your holiness, love, and integrity, you have provided the way of redemption and forgiveness. Spirit of the living God, reveal to each and every one of us our full status as sons and daughters of the living God. Pour the love of God into our hearts, enabling us to know, receive, and experience all our Father has for us. We ask all of this in the name of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. And God's people say, Amen. Let's stand together. I'm going to do a word of benediction, and I've actually just changed what I'm going to do. I'm going to do the most, the normal benediction, Aaron's blessing that I talked about a few weeks ago. But I want you to remember, twice in here, it mentions the face of God. I want you to remember this week, go in this blessing remembering, David said Absalom couldn't see his face. Your father never says that to you. Never in Jesus Christ does he say that. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace.
In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. For more teachings and resources, please visit www.brcc.church.